Will you please join me in our prayer for understanding? Spirit of the living God, we pray. Let more truth and light break forth from your word. In our reading, in our hearing, and in our understanding, in our acting. Amen. Our reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, quote, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up, end quote, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so much the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Here ends our reading. May it be blessed to our understanding. Oh boy, (laughs) what a pericope. I wish we could address it all, but it's not going to happen this morning. We are taking a deep dive, um, reflecting and winding together into just two of the verses this morning. So I thank you in advance for sticking with me and being in this time of wondering together. Now let us pray. May the words in my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. Our lengthy passage this morning begins in the midst of a conversation between Jesus 
and this man Nicodemus. A Pharisee who would visit Jesus in the middle of the night, not with a boombox outside his bedroom window, but to seek further understanding about Jesus' connection to God in private. This conversation centered in a relationship produces one of the most well-known verses of the Bible, John 3, 16. Some have termed it the spark notes of the New Testament or the gospel in a nutshell. Does anyone still use spark notes anymore? I don't think so. Maybe I'm dating myself. But perhaps it should be more fittingly called GPT's attempt at the Bible. In any case, as we contemplate the idea of truth-telling this Lenten season, this reading from our lectionary that includes this verse feels all the more fitting for us to ponder. As many have upheld it as a truth for themselves and for the world, in sometimes life-giving ways or sometimes violent ways. I'm sure we've seen this verse on car bumper stickers, on signs at sports games, plastered on decor at Marshalls or Home Goods, pictured next to images of Jesus on the cross, or next to the word love surrounded by a crown of thorns on the internet for some reason. I find myself longing for these words to be placed next to an image of Jesus joyfully passing out freshly replenished wine to a crowd at a wedding. But I doubt I'll see that anytime soon. Okay, folks, let's get back on track. So what words are we talking about exactly? What does John 3.16 say to make it so famous? The verse reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. End quote. Let's spend some time and unpack these words that are doing some pretty heavy theological lifting, and therefore create room for a whole host of interpretations. It might be that the cultural conversation around these words immediately brings the cross to our minds. Perhaps it's because we're in Lent. So much so that we instinctively complete the phrase, he gave his only son, with the phrase, to die on the cross. Because so often that seems to be the only way to understand it. And certainly the people receiving the Gospel of John at the time would have been stirred to think of the cross by the image of Moses and the snake raised up on his staff that healed his community in their time of need. So our gravitation towards such a reading is understandable. But when I think about focusing on Jesus' death only as the only way in which God has given him over to the world and avoiding doing theology concerning his life and the resurrection, I think of the author of our all-church book read, Cole Arthur Riley, and her words that echo in my mind when she says, quote, it seems cruel to believe that God would require grief to make a truth known, end quote. It also feels incompatible with the message of Jesus's life that many have used this verse to exclude others from God's love who don't believe or intellectually ascend to one way of seeing these words. That if you don't believe in Jesus rightly, then you will be abandoned by God left to perish alone. If you don't believe in Jesus's what exactly? That's my question. His death? His ability to give one individual salvation through his death? His life? His mere existence? It's unclear this morning to me, as even the word to believe is more faithfully translated as to trust in, from the Greek pistis here. It's strange to interpret this verse as a divine commendation 
commendation of a condemning, excuse me, a condemning of individuals in its broader context. We were just told that God so loved the world and that God was and is inherently deeply invested in its healing and wholeness always. In just the next verse, the author says, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. From what we know about love, it is not in God's nature to condemn. Divine love does not punish in the transactional way that us humans in our worst moments conjure up as a method to exact perceived fairness or to see ourselves as good over others. This uplifting of the truth of God's nonviolent nature is not new to progressive Christian interpretations of the Bible and of this verse, but it bears repeating. And at this point in our journey through this sentence, you might be wondering and saying, what's happening? So what, Lexi? Where does that leave us here? Well, we know that Jesus reveals a truth about God. Not that God requires a transaction to be appeased and that we need to intellectually assent to that in order to gain access to some kind of reward necessarily, but that God does not condemn, even when humanity has done its worst. And in fact, God is continually involved in healing the world that God so loves. Revealed in Jesus' life and the resurrection, God brings life out of death and allows our wholeness to coexist with our woundedness. God assures us that the Spirit resides in our world and inspires new life and relationship with God and neighbor continually. What if instead of inserting the words to die on the cross, we automatically finish that phrase, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to live in the world, period. Jesus lived a life in the world that centered embodying love and justice, that opened the way into humility, in other words, into being born anew, even when we think we have all the right answers. He lived a life that widened the circle, that reached across difference to pull people in closer to each other and to God's redeeming spirit that resided in his flesh. He showed us that goodness resides in ours too. Through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus reveals to us that the presence of God can infiltrate our ordinary lives, into our flesh and spirit intertwined, into the broken places of the world, and inspire us to walk in the ways of justice, mercy, and love, to have eternal life. We have been called to live this truth, too. Moving even further into this very complicated sentence that we are all wondering about together. Thanks for bearing with me, friends. So what's the deal with this eternal life thing? This past week, I was helping plan some programming for the spring with a small group of you First Church folks. The passage for the Sunday came up in conversation and someone in the group turned to me and said, they don't think they believe in eternal life. And I asked them, sensing that they had a definition in mind, well, what do you think eternal life means? Their immediate response to my question was to ask it right back at me in first church fashion, do you know what it means? <laughs> And a stream of laughter flowed from us both as we acknowledged the inherent mystery in these words and their frequent association with a certain kind of afterlife. There was such spaciousness to admitting the limits of our human knowledge and naming what sometimes goes unspoken in a church community. The grace experienced in that honest exchange felt like eternal life to me. And if I'm speaking truthfully, I'm somewhat agnostic about what happens when we leave this earthly life. But what I am confident about is that God's love endures beyond our individual lives 
and will always be with us and with those we have loved, that there is something connecting us all internally somehow. How? I can't pretend to be sure. I feel comfortable saying that because Howard Thurman, in his, uh, in his book, admitted that he wasn't quite sure how prayer worked either, so feeling okay admitting that. But after reminding myself of the time that Jesus alludes to eternal life as being defined as knowing God in John chapter 17, I do wonder if this phrase, eternal life, has more to do with how fully we live our lives in the presence of God and love one another as God loves us than it has to do with what happens when we ultimately return to God and to creation in life's end. This morning, I invite us into reading this famous verse with all its complications, with all of its many readings and beliefs about it. And I invite us to trust in the ways Jesus' life points to God's love for the world and for us all, in the ways that Jesus' life shows us God's love and desire for us not to disappear into numbness, into apathy or disconnection, but to love and to live an eternal life with her. Even in the moments we feel unwanted, even in the moments we feel unworthy or unlovable, especially in those moments, God has called us into being for something more than shame, something more than feeling unworthiness or the fear that we are not believing a doctrine rightly when there are people to love right here, right now. In the very same gospel, in, in, in Gospel John, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says himself that he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. Or as some translations say, so that we might have life to the full. The fullness of life can be experienced when we look beyond exclusion and remember the abundance of God's love for the world and for all people in it. The fullness of life can be known when we live our lives in that truth. We receive life eternal when we cultivate the kind of communities that embody and share in the spirit of Christ. The spirit that honors the dignity and worth of every person that seeks justice for the oppressed, that helps us speak honestly about our faith, that makes the table bigger and widens the circle to include all who seek belonging in God's love. To trust in Jesus is to live our lives in deep service and connection to one another and to the presence of love even through death. By simply breathing, as we are worthy of God's love by our very existence. I see this passage this morning that floats above highways on billboards, from its preamble between Jesus and Nicodemus to its call for us all to seek God's love for the world as a passage grounded in relationship and humility, not in expedient individualism. And as we reflect on God's love for the world, as we look ahead to communion later on in our worship, I hear Cole Arthur Riley's words again in my ear. She says, it means something that the Eucharist, this lasting ritual of the presence and memory of God, is a physical nourishment as much as it is spiritual. I've heard much of bodily sacrifice of taking up a cross, of dying and dying again. But I need to hear of resurrection, of the bodily love of receiving that Eucharist." End quote. This Lenten season, let us put aside the things in our lives that lead us away from the truth of God's love and presence in the world. Let us live a life that centers what is eternal, a life of knowing God through community and being witnessed in safety, through joy, through solidarity in our collective liberation, and through our eternal connection to one another and to God.
Amen.